Duongpu Kao's Asava ceased that night. Duongpu Kao recounted, That night, once Nirota, the cessation of suffering, Tuka, and the cessation of the cause of suffering, was over, the knowledge of the extinguishment of mental intoxication, Asavaka Yayana, arose. I knew on my own that defilements, Gilesa, and mental intoxications, Asava, would be extinguished then. Courage arose within me, exactly as you described, and I proceeded to sit there without needing to do anything. It was nearly light when the attainment of enlightenment occurred in a flash, right as I was sitting there. I was conscious that I had just attained enlightenment. The purification, parisuti, that is released to enlightenment, vimutti nibbana, also arose in a perfect, replete manner. The war between defilements and desires, tanha, and mindfulness, sati, and wisdom, banya, that had been fought from the very beginning up to the present, was considered over and done with that very night. After conversing about the Dhamma with Longpu for many hours, I bowed to Longpu and headed back to my hut, Guti. Longpu had instructed, Come back tomorrow night to discuss the Dhamma again, all right? In the many years since I have known the Dhamma, I have never discussed the Dhamma with anyone for this long, because I didn't know who I could talk to that would speak the same language. Longpu even mentioned, Once, a long time ago, I spoke to Venerable Mahabua about the Dhamma, but we didn't speak for long because we were at a function we had been invited to. We merely spoke about the main points. Since then, only you have gotten me to talk about the Dhamma again. The following night, when the coast was clear of monks and novices, Samanera, I went up to Lungpu's Guti to continue our Dhamma conversation. That night, Lungpu led me to his bedroom so that we could talk as much as we wanted. That night, Lungpu brought up self, atta, and not self, anatta as the first topic. Longpu remarked, In order to know and see anatta with clarity, once the mind, jitta, has fully entered makatsamanki, you must go in and extinguish all atta. If there is no atta to extinguish, then there is no anatta. Therefore, anatta is something that isn't anything, and there is no anything, there is no me, and there is no you. Initially, there must be self, atta, Self in form, rupa, and self in mental factors, nama. Niroda, the extinguishment of suffering and the extinguishment of the cause of suffering, must extinguish the wrong views and extinguish the wrong understandings that the mind has clung to and mistakenly believed substantiated form and mental factors being self. Once this wrong understanding is destroyed, form and mental factors are merely form and mental factors. That's all. There can no longer be any delusion of self because you know and see very clearly that the truth is, self is merely a convention, samuti, of outward action, giriya. However, that which is not displayed externally, akiriya, which is the basis for seeing self as not self, has to do with the universal truths, such a dhamma, of reality. While you are still alive, you continue to rely on self, atta, until the lifespan of your body and mind, tatukanta, is no longer sustainable. But there is nothing to bind or connect to the purity, parisuti, because you clearly know and clearly see that form, rupa, is not self. Self is not form, rupa. Form, rupa, does not exist in self. Self does not exist in form, rupa. Feeling, vetana, is not self. Self is not feeling, vetana. Feeling, vetana, does not exist in self. Self does not exist in feeling, vetana. Memory, sanya, is not self. Self is not memory, sanya. Memory, sanya, does not exist in self. Self does not exist in memory, sanya. Mental formations, sankara, are not self. Self is not mental formations, sankara. Mental formations, sankara, do not exist in self. Self does not exist in mental formations, sankara. Consciousness, vijnana, is not self. Self is not consciousness, vijnana. Consciousness, vijnana, does not exist in self. Self does not exist in consciousness, vijnana. If body and mind, rupa nama, are not self, self is not body and mind, rupa nama. Body and mind, rupa nama, do not exist in self. Self does not exist in body and mind, rupa nama. That is, self, atta, has been destroyed. That is why it is called not self, anatta. There is no animal, there is no human. 
There is no body. There is no self. There is no me. There is no you in anything. Thus, it is merely a condition of nature, sapavat dhamma, that we speak of in terms of conventional reality, samuti. There is only emptiness. There is no meaning, nimitta, or significance in the convention, samuti. It is like the number zero. Even if you were to line up a great many zeros, it would not have any significance in terms of value. If you were to lead them with one, two, three, all of the zeros would signify value and indicate amount. Lumpu then drew a comparison to a muntjac. There was a muntjac that went to live in a forest grove on a small hill. Thousands of people encircled the forest grove, and each and every person saw the muntjac enter the grove. Then, those thousands of people, who formed a ring around the forest grove, walked into the forest, maintaining the airtight ring formation with everyone lined up shoulder to shoulder facing into the forest. They turned over every leaf and blade of grass, but they did not see the muntjac. Then, they raised the trees and grass to the ground, so that only a level dirt ground remained. The thousands of people went and stood there until the area was completely filled in, and not even a fraction of an inch's worth of empty space could be found. Even so, the muntjac was not seen. The assumption that the four elements, chatu tatu, and five aggregates, panchakanta, are self, atta, is the same way. Once your insight knowledge, vipassana yana, goes in and contemplates until you know and see according to reality, there is no four elements, there is no five aggregates, there is no self in the five aggregates whatsoever. And nirota, the cessation of suffering and the cessation of the cause of suffering, has all occurred. Thus, it is called anatta, or emptiness. There is nothing that is self, atta, at all. Ignorance, avicca, delusion, moha, and wrong views, micha, titi, have caused us to hold on to this kind of wrong assumption for eternity. That is why we have cycled through birth and death for so long. I asked Lung Pu, with permission, Lung Pu, where did you look for the muntjac? Lung Pu replied, at Long Kot Subdistrict, Prao District, Chiang Mai Province during December. As for the day or year, I used to be able to remember all of it, but after so much time has passed, Sanya Anita has eaten it all up. As for the time, it was nearly light. I attained enlightenment in the sitting posture, Iriyapata. After I knew that I had attained release from the three realms, it was like you said, Venerable Tun. I suddenly thought of the Buddha, and I thought a lot about Lung Pu Man. In thinking of them, it wasn't that I wanted the Buddha or wanted Lung Pu Man to make a declaration, Payakarana, about me. I merely thought of how grateful I was for the Buddha and how grateful I was for Lung Pu Man. That's all. It was due to the Buddha's benevolence, metta, and sympathy for all sentient beings that he established the Buddhist religion for all of us. If the Buddha did not leave us with the religion, we would never be able to know and see the truth of the Dhamma. In this era, Lung Pu Man studied the Buddha's teachings and found the path correctly. He practiced Patipati until he successfully achieved full enlightenment as an arahant. He then taught his many students who continue to attain arahantship to this day. This gratitude is the reason why I thought of him. Then Lung Pu began to ask me questions. What kind of comparison did you draw to the awakening to the Dhamma? Tell me about it. With permission, Lung Pu. I compared having awakened to the Dhamma to taking a large chunk of red charcoal with flames coming from it, submerging it in water, and leaving it for a long while. When you pick it up, you know that the fire in the charcoal has been completely extinguished. When you touch it with your hand, there seems to be residual heat, but the fuel for fire has completely been extinguished. Even if you pour fuel onto it and light it, fire will not emerge from that chunk of charcoal. Lompu grinned and said, that's a good comparison. It's just like mine. I asked Lung Pu, with permission, Lung Pu, shortly after you had awakened to the Dhamma, did you think about wanting to teach the Dhamma to anyone? Lung Pu turned the question back to me. What about you? Did you think about wanting to teach the Dhamma to anyone? With permission, Lung Pu, if I say it, it is like I'm imitating the Buddha. The truth is that I did not want to teach the Dhamma to anyone because the Dhamma was so refined and therefore difficult for anyone to comprehend. I felt that way for about five minutes. Then I thought about the reason I had come to awaken to the Dhamma at that time. Why wouldn't others be able to awaken to the Dhamma like me? 
Each of us has cultivated perfections of character, bharami, in order to achieve release from suffering. If I can awaken to the Dhamma, then others can awaken to the Dhamma just like I did. After hearing what I had to say, Nongpu laughed and said, I was the same way. It is a natural thing that occurs organically. This kind of thing arises momentarily and then vanishes on its own because you realize that if you can know the Dhamma, then others must be able to know the Dhamma just like you. If someone were to come and learn the Dhamma from you, you would be willing to teach them. I continued to ask Lung Pu, With permission, Lung Pu, within the three to four days following your attainment of Dhamma, did your mind possess any kind of strength? Lung Pu exclaimed, Indeed, strength arose in my mind at that time. It was as if I could carry an entire mountain or uproot a large tree in its entirety and carry it somewhere far away. But if my physical strength wasn't ready, nothing could be done. Then Long Pu asked me the same question. What about you? How was it? I answered, the same as you, Long Pu. There was one thing I asked Long Pu about, for which he provided a very clear answer. It was something we discussed only between the two of us. I have never told anyone about it, because people in this day and age wouldn't believe it anyway. When speaking about Arahants, most people don't even believe that Arahants truly exist in this era. What I asked Long Pu was, Regarding Arahant relics, Arahant Tatu, once a teacher, a jariya, or someone who is an Arahant dies and is cremated, all of their bones turn into sacred relics, Tatu. Why does that happen? And when does it start to happen? Nongpu didn't want to answer. He even said, How do you understand it to be? Tell me. With permission, Nongpu, I asked you first. You have to answer me first. Nongpu then explained why bones become sacred relics, tatu. He said, Regarding bones becoming sacred relics, tatu, it only happens to the bones of those who have attained enlightenment as arahants. The bones of holy individuals, arya bukala, of other levels, are not yet able to turn into sacred relics because there are still defilements, gilesa. The bones turn into sacred relics because of the virtue of the purification dhamma, visutti dhamma. In other words, Pure Dhamma, Parisutti Dhamma, has arisen. This pure Dhamma purifies every part of the body as well. Even the bones are purified by this pure Dhamma. From the moment that one attains this pure Dhamma, the Dhamma starts to purify the elements, Tatu. No more than seven days later, this pure Dhamma has purified the elements in various body parts, making them all pure. While still alive, the bones are just normal bones. After death, the bones are burned and transform into sacred relics. I asked Lung Pu, when the pure Dhamma was purifying the elements, did you know it? Lung Pu replied, yes, why wouldn't I know it? Then he asked me back, did you know when the pure Dhamma was purifying the elements? I answered, yes. Lung Pu said, it's the same, that's how it happened to me. I then asked Lung Pu about the fruit, pala, of applied practice, patipati, and theoretical knowledge, pariyati. With permission, Lung Pu, how are theoretical knowledge and the fruit of practice different? Oh, the knowledge from theory and the fruit that arises from practice are very different, because theoretical knowledge is coarse dhamma, while the fruit of practice is very refined. It is like knowing the name of food or knowing the name of fruit, but never having tasted the food or fruit. It is impossible to correctly guess what the taste will be like. Theoretical knowledge and applied practice are the same way. If you only study theory but don't practice, you will never experience the flavor of Dhamma at all. If someone experiences the flavor of Dhamma, then they have not wasted their life. Lompu added, This era is a venerable Potila era. People are showing off the empty scriptures they are carrying. People in this era don't believe that the fruit of practice, or pativeta, exists. That's why they aren't practicing. Or if they do practice, they are practicing too much in the way of the hermits, tapasa, and ascetics, isi. The instructors have misunderstood and misinterpreted the Dhamma, thus giving rise to wrong perception of the theoretical doctrine, pariyati. Upon putting it to practice, it becomes micha patipati, or wrong practice. The results that arise from wrong practice, micha patipati, are results that are wrong, micha. They are not in accordance with the noble fruit, aryapala, of the Buddha in any way. This era is at the end of the Buddhist religion, 
So this is how it has to be. There is no way to fix it. This is the point where the Buddhist religion declines. It is the Buddhist community, Buddha Barisa, that is causing the decline, and it will continue to decline progressively. Then, Dongpu asked me the same question. What are your thoughts about theoretical knowledge and applied practice? With permission, Dongpu, there is a great difference between theoretical knowledge and applied practice. Theoretical knowledge is like oil that is extracted from the ground. You cannot make use of it in a vehicle or machine quite yet. You have to take that crude oil and refine it until it becomes a pure oil. Then you will be able to make effective use of it. Similarly, Dongpu, the crude oil is like theoretical knowledge, bariyati, and refining that oil until it becomes pure is like applied practice, patipati. Getting beneficial results from the use of that oil is like the fruit of practice, pativeta, that we call parisutti dhamma, or dhamma that is pure at all times. It does not decline in any way. Regardless of where you are or what posture you may be in, the purity is dispassionate, virakatama, and it is unshakable, akupatama, and it is dhamma that does not relapse. Every arahant must be this way. That is why they are katangkaraniyang, or one who has no further tasks to accomplish.